In this gap video, we're going to be talking circuit etiquette. We've travelled the country talking to some of our industry's experts on how to make the circuit work for everyone. You're going to hear from helicopter, microlight and fixed wing pilots about their disciplines of flying and what they need you to know. This video isn't a capsule and doesn't replace flight instruction, but it is meant as a reset of the standard, so we're all on the same page. The circuit is our means of controlling the flow pattern around the aerodrome to ensure that we've got predictable flow paths for our aircraft taking off and landing, departing and arriving, and allowing our pilots to practice circuits in a measured, safe way. The standard circuit is a left pattern consisting of five circuit legs. Upwind to at least 500 feet. Crosswind, where the aircraft climbs and a turn is made at 45 degrees to the threshold onto the downwind. The downwind leg is flown at 1,000 feet and parallel to the runway. Base is turned at 45 degrees to the threshold. The aircraft is slowed and descended to no lower than 500 feet. And final, where the aircraft is flown to the landing point. Not all aerodromes uh, in the country fly the standard circuit procedure. Um, if there are variations, we can find this in the AIP Volume 4 underneath the relevant aerodrome chart. So some of these uh, circuit variations can include flying the downwind leg at a lower altitude or joining uh, the standard overhead join at a different altitude. Some aerodromes have a minimum approach speed uh, that is to be maintained. So it's really important to go and have a look in the AIP Volume 4 um, and make sure that you've done appropriate pre-flight planning before you head out. Now we understand the basic circuit pattern, we need to understand that there may be differences between users based on type. Aaron, Steve and Bevan will now tell us about the difference with helicopter, gliding and warbird circuits. When operating in a circuit anywhere, you need to have a good understanding of the different aircraft that are operating in that circuit. They all have different speeds, different climb angles, different approach angles, different approach speeds. So that is going to affect how the circuit is flown. Helicopter circuits are shorter, so they're closer into the airfield. They are slower and the takeoff and particularly the approach are a lot steeper. Downwind, particularly, helicopter would only be 75 knots, maybe 80 maximum. Uh, on approach, uh, 60 is the standard, and crossing the threshold would be 30 knots, so we're very, very slow. Gliders do perform a reasonably standard circuit, and it's the 900, 500 foot, 300 foot circuit. But sometimes we do get caught out with wind, wave, sea breeze coming in and things like that. So um, we have to sometimes adjust our circuits because the whole thing's a very dynamic atmosphere. Uh, we could be coming downwind and we're only a thousand feet above the ground and if we run into 500 feet a minute uh, rate of descent, uh, we've got uh, a minute or so before we can land. So we might be going halfway downwind, sinking at 500 feet a minute, and we might have to turn base leg halfway down the airfield. Flying in the circuit with warbirds and vintage aeroplanes can be a bit of a challenge. So the circuit pattern in something like a tiger moth is often a little bit narrower than a standard Cessna or a um, general aviation aeroplane. Once we start stepping up into high performance aeroplanes like the Harvard, uh, where normally a reasonably standard circuit as we can bring the aeroplane back to about 110 knots or so in the downwind. Um, but we do try and do a reasonably curved approach. A, a long straight and final and any warbird is uh, not a great idea. Once the nose starts coming up you can't see the aeroplane in front of you or the runway. Microlight's a very generic term these days. Microlight can mean anything from a tube and fabric 
aircraft cruising at 50 knots to something cruising at 150 knots. The common factor with all of them is the slow stall speed. And as we know, we generally try and approach to land at about 1.3 times your configured stall speed, which can still be very slow for some microlights. The pilot of a traditional GA aircraft needs to ensure that they're going to give microlight pilots enough space, enough time uh, to fly their normal final approach at a speed probably much slower than you were we. All circuit activities are underpinned by four rules found in part 91. They are use of aerodromes, operating on and in the vicinity of an aerodrome, operating near other aircraft, and the right-of-way rules. These four rules set up the predictability and flow of the traffic. I think it's really important that pilots conform to the four circuit rules because if you start doing things that are outside of the norm, you become unpredictable and then nobody can determine what you're going to do. Predictable circuits are essential for pilots, especially inexperienced pilots, to build a picture. And that starts with the direction of the circuit. It's published in the AIP. We must comply with it. That predictability in how we fly the circuit is what allows other pilots to know our intentions, where we're going to go, where we're going to be. If you don't conform, how else is everybody meant to know what you're going to be doing? All right, it's super important to be standard because then everybody knows what everybody else is doing. If we fly unusual shaped or sized circuits, it's going to add complexity and challenges to the other pilots who are trying to operate in the same airspace with us. Let's not make it more complicated than it has to be for the other players in our world. Speeds and circuit sizes may vary between aircraft types. Making sequencing work between various types is essential to avoid conflict. The first thing is to observe the other aircraft and make sure that you take a note of the uh, type, the speed, their trajectory, whether they're climbing or descending, and then put that together with your knowledge bank and try and figure out what they're going to do and how you're going to integrate with them. The other thing that we um, we need to look at as well with fixed wing is, you know, the closure rate, making sure that we give the helicopter enough space. It's very hard when you're in the downwind, particularly looking at an approaching aircraft on the same level, to be able to judge those closing speeds. So understanding that a helicopter flies slower than the fixed wing is, uh, goes a long way to uh, understanding how quickly you can close up on a machine. Both fixed wing and helicopter pilots need to be aware of the dangers of wake turbulence associated with helicopters. Fixed wing pilots should avoid landing or taking off in an area through which a helicopter has just hover taxied or an area from which a helicopter has just landed or taken off. Helicopter pilots need to exercise airmanship to avoid causing dangerous situations for other users who may not be familiar with the dangers of helicopter wake. So at unattended aerodromes, if you have uh, you know, aircraft in the circle with you and you're trying to increase the separation uh, between you and another aircraft, for example, if there's someone ahead of you and you're closing on them in the downwind, um, there might be a good example. You could extend your climb out, extend your crosswind or extend your downwind. Uh, if you're ahead of someone and you know that they're going to catch up to you, um, it might be a good opportunity for you to practice a glide approach um, or even a short approach to increase the spacing so you do a shorter circuit uh, and they can continue with their standard circuit. When building separation, it's the following aircraft's responsibility to allow the aircraft ahead enough space and time to complete their approach, climb out or landing. Extending a circuit leg or reducing speed on the downwind are the preferred methods of building the separation. Orbits should be avoided at unattended aerodromes because they can put an aircraft into head-on conflict with following traffic. Sequencing also affects ground traffic who must give way to traffic landing and taking off. 
The right-of-way rules apply throughout our operation of the aeroplane, and specific right-of-way rules are published with regard to aeroplanes on the ground and aircraft coming into land. The landing aeroplane has right-of-way. I always like to see a lookout turn prior to lining up to build the situation awareness of any aircraft in the circuit or on base or final, just for absolute clarity. And a great way to do that is make sure that you park either on a 45 degree to the runway and have a good look, or doing a clearing turn before you, you line up. It's your responsibility to spot any other traffic that are coming into land, and you need to give way to them. We're very fortunate with helicopters that we are able to hover and carry out pedal turns. So my suggestion is prior to entering the taxiway and particularly the active runway, stop the helicopter short in the hover, do a full 360 degree pedal turn. Means that we can have a good look at the downwind, finals and the non-traffic side prior to entering the active runway. Sequencing can also be challenging when you need to practice circuit emergencies. Circuit emergencies such as glide approaches, auto rotations, flapless landings and simulated engine failures need to be practiced. However, when you're conducting them, you must not cause conflict. The main thing with the glide approach or the flapless approach is, you know, when you're uncontrolled, it's the consideration with the other traffic and the closure rate. When you do a glide approach, you're essentially going to be cutting off most of the, the base leg and the, the final. It's, it's more of a short approach rather than a normal approach. For example, if you're wanting to practice a glide approach, you would want to make sure that there's no one coming in on final ahead of you when you decide to call the simulation. So auto rotations are a manoeuvre carried out by helicopters in the event of an engine failure. So they don't, helicopters don't glide like a fixed wing does. They need to fall out of the sky to spin the blades up. Um, and that's what reduces their rate of descent to allow them to get to the ground safely. What fixed wing pilots need to understand about auto rotations is they are initiated from generally a thousand feet AGL and just over the threshold of the runway. So we're very close in. The descent angle can be up to 75 degrees. All right, so we're coming down very steep and um, rates of descent on an average 1800 to 2000 feet a minute. And from the beginning of the auto rotation till the end, uh, we're looking at maybe 30 seconds start to finish. We don't want to cause congestion with other aircraft. We don't want to, them to have to avoid us when we're carrying out the emergencies. So if it starts to get too busy, or you might even recognise that the pilots in the circuit don't understand what you're doing, that might be a time to take your emergencies somewhere else or another day. If we're teaching low-level circuits, sometimes it's simulating low cloud base, uh, poor weather. It's required so that the aeroplane can be flying slowly, close to the aerodrome, so that uh, the pilot keeps sight of the aerodrome and where they want to land. But when you are flying a low-level circuit, it's important to think about your positioning uh, in terms of other traffic. They're not going to necessarily know where to look uh, unless you advise them that you're in the low-level circuit. When an instructor is teaching the bad weather circuit, or when a pilot decides to use the bad weather circuit, they need to be aware that they're going away from the standard. If there's other circuit traffic flying a standard circuit, they must integrate with that, so the other circuit traffic has priority. Many reported airborne conflict events occur during the vacating or joining of the circuit. When vacating and joining the circuit, good decision making supported by a robust situational awareness and standard predictable procedures are key. To vacate the circuit, we can make use of any of our circuit legs, be it upwind, crosswind, downwind or base. Announce your intentions as part of your departure call and if you're making a downwind call, again, announce your intentions. You don't want somebody following you in the downwind waiting for you to turn base if you're continuing to truck out of the downwind to vacate the circuit. If an aircraft is coming in to join at an aerodrome, whether it's via the standard overhead join or directly onto one of the circuit legs, it's important to make sure you've maintained um, a good lookout and you've spotted the other traffic that already exists in the circuit. 
In terms of joining at an unattended aerodrome, the default standard would be the standard overhead join. Uh, but if you're happy with the conditions and you know, you know what the field's like and what runway's in use, you can join direct downwind base or final. Before doing a direct join, make sure that the timing's going to work between you and other existing circuit traffic. Make sure you're not going to cut anyone off. Make sure that no one will have to change what they're doing to fit you in. Essentially, in terms of joining direct downwind base or final, the aircraft that are already established in the circuit will have the right of way over the aircraft that are joining. Although powered fixed wing aircraft must join overhead or directly onto a circuit leg, pilots need to be aware there are also allowances for helicopters and gliders. The rules allow for a helicopter to join non-standard in a circuit. That is anywhere that is not downwind, base, finals or overhead. If we are joining non-standard, we need to make sure that we communicate that clearly to anyone else that's operating in the circuit. But the important thing for a helicopter pilot is that we need to make sure that we uh, don't cause conflict with any other traffic that's in the circuit. Sometimes we may not be able to get over onto the AIP published circuit of the airfield. We may have to do a non-standard circuit on the other side rather than cross over, get low and perform a very low, low turn. The skydive plane descends really, really quickly, about 5,000 feet a minute. It's really important that when we're descending, we descend away from the circuit so that we're away from traffic. It's equally as important to join the, tra join the circuit in a standard way. So once we've completed the descent at that high descent rate, we slow the aircraft down and we join the circuit in a normal way. It's really, really important that we don't come into the circuit in a way that compromises the other traffic already in the circuit. It's absolutely not okay to come screaming into the circuit from uh, the top. When a pilot is deciding on a joining method, it's important they consider other factors and airspace users. Sometimes the standard overhead join may create conflict with existing users or operations. The overhead join should be avoided when the skydiving happening gliders being winched, those types of activities. Also when the uh, cloud base is too low for an overhead join, I think it's important that all joining methods are practiced and pilots are current in them and they understand them. The pilot then has a, has a good big toolbox of joining procedures that can be used for um, all the different scenarios that um, he or she may face. Agricultural aircraft engaged in agricultural work off the aerodrome may also operate without conforming to the published circuit or the active runway. However, they must not cause conflict to other users. At unattended aerodromes without the help of a control tower to control the flow and separation of traffic, the responsibility is on all pilots to sequence and avoid conflict. Airborne conflict generally occurs in the circuit when one or both pilots have an ineffective lookout which leads to the loss of situational awareness. Pilots may even be aware of a developing conflict or know another aircraft is close to them but do not have them in sight. Look, if you don't have anybody in sight in the circuit and you know that they're there particularly, then remove yourself from that situation. When you're in the circuit and you feel there may be potential for conflict and you can't spot the other traffic, it's important to communicate. And if that doesn't work, maintain wings level and vacate. Have a good look round and then vacate. You know, whether it's a go round or you just clear the circuit area, um, then that's what you need to do. Get out of a circuit, take stock, get clear, and then come back and join. All right, and don't rejoin the circuit until you've got everybody in sight. Clear the circuit area, carry out a standard overhead rejoin, reassess where everybody is, and then integrate into the circuit. If something happens in the circuit, there's no need to get upset. Things happen. Sometimes we do get cut off. People make mistakes. At that point, deconflict, remain cool, communicate if you have to, and once the conflict is resolved, 
continue with what you were doing. The radio in the middle of a busy circuit environment is not a time to start chastising people. Fly the aeroplane first and be courteous about letting other people fly their aeroplanes. Conflict can occur when differing types of aviation mix within the uncontrolled circuit, such as VFR, IFR, gliding and parachuting. Having a basic understanding of each other can vastly reduce this conflict from occurring. An IFR approach is an imaginary road that brings us to a place um, safely, um, avoiding the terrain, so we can hopefully break visual and then continue the approach to land. I think in the most simple terms, it's just that. Um, we follow imaginary lines in the sky and our equipment is telling us where these lines are. We don't have the flexibility of movement. I think that's probably the biggest one. You feel like you can have everything under control. You're ahead of the aircraft procedurally. You know what's going on. You're in a good place. And then it all starts. You're in the descent. You're on your way to maybe a hold or to start the approach. And then typically now someone gets airborne, someone taxis out and you've got to manage and deal with, OK, I've now got circuit traffic joining the party. And it becomes, uh, yeah, quite a high workload very quickly. So IFR is like another language to the typical GA pilot. If you're flying an IFR aircraft and you're coming into an uncontrolled airfield, particularly on a day where there's lots of VFR pilots flying. Remember, they don't have the same maps and charts that you have. For IFR traffic that are coming and going from unattended aerodromes, it may be helpful to include a VFR reporting point um, along with the IFR reporting points so that our student pilots or our recreational pilots in the area have a much better understanding of where this IFR traffic is and how we can all sequence in together. For me, you know, comms is a big one. We've all got our rules, we hopefully all know our rules and how we're going to operate, but if we can communicate clearly to each other, um, then it's just so much simpler, so much easier. A good radio call, a clear radio call, concise, well formatted, delivered, just is a game changer for any pilot. I know clearly where that person is, what their intentions are and how they're going to manage themselves and they seem to understand what I'm doing. When an IFR aircraft breaks visual and is visually manoeuvring around the airfield for the most suitable runway, then it absolutely has to apply to the usual rules of separation and sequencing. Um, it can't get its elbows out and bully people round. You know, the, um, our job is to sequence in safely and efficiently with other VFR. I would encourage anyone that operates out of an aerodrome that has IFR traffic as well to go out and get familiar with the IFR procedures in your area, whether you want to talk to an IFR pilot that's local to the airfield or go to your local aero club and ask one of the instructors, they'll help you out. We've all got our rules, we hopefully all know our rules and how we're going to operate, but if we can communicate clearly to each other, then it's just so much simpler, so much easier. The AIP tells us that IFR must integrate with other traffic. However, in certain meteorological conditions, it may need VFR traffic to give priority to the IFR. For example, if the aerodrome is overcast, then the joining IFR traffic cannot visually separate or sequence. In this situation, it would be best practice, once the IFR traffic is established on three to five mile final, for VFR circuit traffic to either land and wait or extend a circuit leg, remaining clear of the approach and overshoot for the IFR traffic's runway. This allows the IFR traffic to safely break visual and complete their approach. Winch launching of gliders is relatively common in New Zealand. Mike is going to talk us through a winch launch so we know what to expect when we encounter one while we're out flying. A standard winch launch in New Zealand usually goes somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 feet above the ground. And starting on the ground, the launch point controller, about two minutes before the glider takes off, will put out an aerial call to advise all traffic in the area that a winch launch will be taking place to approximately two to 3,000 feet above the airstrip. When the glider pilot is ready to go, the cable is connected onto the bottom of the glider and then the wings are levelled. The person who's running the wingtip checks that there is no traffic and checks all clear above and behind. 
The launch point controller then signals to the winch to take up slack. That's where they take the slackness out in the rope until the rope is very tight. And once the rope is very tight, then the signal is given and the glider will go from 0 to 60 knots in about one to two seconds and start climbing at about 45 degrees and it will take about one minute to reach two to 3,000 feet. It can be challenging for powered pilots working in the circuit with a glider. Mike offers us some advice. Most gliders fly the circuit somewhere between 50 and 60 knots. Your average Cessna would be flying at about 90 knots, so there's a very real problem of overtaking in the circuit. The best thing to do when you're joining a circuit with another glider is to stay outside of the glider and give it a bit of space because the glider is, has to land. And if you just fly outside us, you'll be able to see us, extend downwind and then follow us in when we land. Once you've landed in your powered aircraft, it's really important that you clear the runway as soon as possible because the glider behind you has no choice to land and will be following you in. If you're going to fly into a gliding site and you're not used to flying into a gliding site, the first thing you need to do is consult your charts and then consult the AIP. The AIP is very good with all the information that you need to know about it, especially if it's a winch site, it'll tell you where the cables are and it'll tell you the height that we're winching to. And if you're not sure about, still not sure about that, then give them a call. Just as with IFR traffic and gliding operations, pilots need to be aware of how and where parachutes and skydive aircraft will operate around unattended aerodromes to avoid conflicting with their operation. Stu tells us more. If you're going to an aerodrome that has parachuting activities happening at the aerodrome, it will be promulgated in the AIP and there will be parachute symbols on the chart and there will be a phone number for the operator. So it's really important to do your prep before you go into that airfield. It's really important to understand that the parachutes are not necessarily always right over top of the airfield. The parachute aircraft runs in towards the direction of the wind and if it's really windy upstairs, they might drop the parachutes actually, or the parachute is actually as far as a mile away from the airport. Um, that means that they can be opening between 5,000 feet and 3,000 feet anywhere a mile around the airport. So it's not just directly overhead the airport. So the normal process for a skydive pilot is after they take off to get whatever clearances they need to make the climb to whatever altitude they're going, then that pilot will make a two minute call prior to dropping the parachutists overhead the airfield. So at that two minute call, we consider the, the parachute drop area to be live. If a pilot is entering an area and hears that two minute call, um, the best thing to do is just to stay away until the, the parachute pilot then calls jumpers away. Normally takes about somewhere between five to six minutes from the time the parachute opens till the time they're on the ground. So giving yourself a five minute window is a good, is, gives yourself a good safety margin. Situational awareness is an essential skill for all pilots and is the key to good airmanship. It's really about building up a mental picture of what's happening around you, the airfield, and understanding the movements of the traffic. Our situational awareness as we approach, join and operate within the aerodrome circuit pattern is vital. And it's not just a snapshot of now. We can build that through listening for the radio calls of the other aircraft operating and plotting in our heads where they are now. That's fine. I call it three-dimensional aerial chess, to plot where those aircraft are going to be and how they're going to potentially conflict you in the circuit. Develop your mental map, understand what other aircraft are doing, um, and then that's going to develop the skill set which is going to aid your situational awareness, you know, building the mental picture. It's important to start building the bigger picture of what's happening from the moment you arrive at the aerodrome. As you're pre-flighting, as you're taxiing out towards the runway, you can start building your situational awareness when you're walking out to the aircraft by actually looking around and seeing who's in the circuit. You know, you can hear the aircraft, you can see the aircraft probably a lot more clearly, and that's a great way to start prior to the flight. It's important to maintain your lookouts and maintain listening watch so you are always aware of what that bigger picture is. 
ADSB technology allows aircraft to broadcast and receive position and altitude information from each other, helping pilots in building their mental picture. Well, ADSB is a great tool for sure, um, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, it gives you the big picture, but it doesn't necessarily give you the whole picture. Uh, there's a lot of time spent with people with these new screens, these new technology. Uh, they're looking inside at their screen and they pipe up on the radio and say, I've got you on the ADSB. I'd much prefer you rather than looking at your screen, stick your eyes outside your windscreen and have a look for me rather than uh, telling me that you've got you on your screen. ADSB is a great tool, but most gliders in this country don't have ADSB fitted. I would estimate approximately 20% of the gliders in this country have it, so you're not going to see us. You need to be looking out of the window. Some World War I aeroplanes or vintage aeroplanes do not have ADSB, generally because they don't have an electrical system at all. It's a great help to pilots, but it doesn't replace the Mark I eyeball. All right. Too many times um, I hear about people saying, I haven't got you on TCAS, or, you know, is your transponder working? And you're sharing a circuit with someone. You know, you should already know that they are there and you should know their relative position in the circuit without having to uh, refer to any of the aids that have been built into the cockpit. We build our situational awareness or our moving map using our listening watch, lookout and other aids. We can then use our situational awareness to guide our airmanship and decision making. Part of our ability to fly the circuit safely rests on our airmanship. Airmanship relates to the rules of the road and how we behave amongst our fellow flyers. We want to make sure that we fly predictably, consistently and safely at all times. Airmanship is it's a way of being. It's a way of being considerate to other pilots that are in the air, much as you would do if you were playing sports. Yeah, airmanship to me is just treating each other with respect and combining our knowledge, our skills and our experience so that we can all integrate together and get home safe. So airmanship in the circuit is um, really important in my eyes. It's been predictable in terms of what you're doing, being courteous to others and thinking about the overall picture uh, of what's going on around you. Just as airmanship is vital for a safe operation in the air, bringing that airmanship and communication along with constructive relationships back onto the ground is vital for an aerodrome safety culture. Another way to improve the operating environment around the airport is to be engaged with the airport. I think working together with everybody at the aerodrome makes a big difference to the safety at the aerodrome. So it's important to have good relationships with other operators and other airfield users so that you can create a really healthy environment on your airfield. This makes it much easier for everyone just to work together um, when you're in the circuit. Engaging with the other operators and especially if there is a forum available through a user group meeting established either by Pilots for Pilots or by the airport company, which is even better because it brings the ones operating the airfield to the same table. I'm a great believer of common sense and communication. On a busy airfield like this, it's really important that the operators and the users and the participants at the airfield get together and talk to each other and understand what each other is doing. By doing that, what we do is we get, we get a better picture of how things are going to operate and we can solve problems before they arise. I think it's really, really important that we continually work together. And if we do have an issue, instead of storming across the air and getting grumpy, just go and have a chat. We've built a really good relationship with the, with the flying club and, um, and the door goes both ways. So the air club comes and sees us and we can go and see them to try and sort out any issues before they become issues. We hope you found this video useful. As you would have noticed, all of our experts have talked around standard procedures, predictability and lookout. Feel free to talk to your flight instructor if you have any questions or reach out to us through the website. Remember, fly friendly. <laughs>